Buenas tardes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, my name is uh, Maximo, v Maximo Vidal. I'm the president of AmCham. And uh, I'd like to welcome to the session, which is part of the Dominican Week that uh, American Chamber of Commerce organizes every, every year. This session is, as you know, is uh, directly related to the development of capital markets um, in the Dominican Republic. Um, I would like to th thank uh, Jamile Eusebio and the uh, Global Foundation for Democracy and Development for helping supporting this event and helping us arrange this, this venue, which is, uh, you know, uh, it should work very, very, very well. Also, I would like to thank Frank Gutierrez. He runs uh, the Dow uh, group here in, in New York, and he has been uh, extremely helpful in, in uh, getting all these things set up. Also, I'd like to thank AmCham, the, the staff of AmCham that has worked uh, diligently to uh, put this event together, our sponsors, our panelists, and all of you for, for joining, joining us today. Um, I would like to talk briefly about you know what Dominican Week is and what we have done so far. Um, you know, we spent three days in Washington, D.C., two days. Uh, we have meetings with the um, with, uh, State Department, Department of Labor, IFC, World Bank. Um, we had a meeting with um, also the uh, uh, IDB. And we had a, a superb event at the residence of, uh, of the Dominican ambassador with all the stakeholders of the of Dominican Week where we recognized uh, three Dominican professionals that have been working in, in, in the U.S. for, for some time. Uh, the purpose of Dominican Week is basically, from Amchan's perspective, is to understand what needs to be done to develop a more competitive uh, private sector in Dominican Republic. And that's where I, where this session comes in and why, why, why it's relevant. Um, you know, the local, capital markets in the Dominican Republic are, are beginning to become relevant. We have a significant source of funding via the pension funds that's not being, it could be used in a more efficient way, let's say. Um, as you all know, um, the, the use of these funds by the real sector of the economy and the private sector it generally produces a important increment in economic development. So far, the public sector has been using these funds uh, significantly, which is not necessarily, which is okay. But I think what we need to develop is that awareness that these funds are available, that they are definitely competitive, and that the private sector should really uh, be the, uh, place as an objective that use of the funds to continue to grow and to continue to, and continue to become more competitive. At the same time, uh, the development of the international capital markets supporting the local private sector and the DR is also very, very relevant and something that we need to tie together with the local capital markets. And what, 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 the, what can the local community here in New York you professionals can do in terms of what we would like to achieve. And it's basically very simple, you know, the awareness, the awareness that this, there's a significant a source of funding in the local capital markets that can be tapped by the private sector. And, and that there's a number of things that the private sector need, need, they need to do to re, re, be able to access this in an efficient way. And one of, one, of them, one of them is corporate governance, transparency, and be able to really uh, do the, uh, the disclosure that needs to be done to access these funds. And this is really, really important. Uh, unless we do that, unless the private sector does that, these funds um, you know, will, will not have the impact they could have in the development of, of, the, of the economy in the Dominican Republic. So again, I would like to thank you know, the sponsors uh, the Global Foundation, uh, Dow, uh, and all the you know panelists for for joining us. And again, thanks for being here.
Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Yamile Eusebio Paulino. Soy la directora de la oficina en Nueva York de la Global Foundation for Democracy and Development y también la directora del programa de actividades formativas en la Fundación Global Democracia y Desarrollo en República Dominicana. Como dominicana, prefiero hablar en español. Sé que algunos no hablan el español bien o no lo entienden bien. Trataré de hacer las breves palabras de bienvenida en los dos idiomas para que toda la audiencia me pueda entender, pero hablaré básicamente en español. <risa> Señor Máximo Vidal, muchísimas gracias por sus palabras. Para nosotros es un honor poder colaborar con la Cámara Americana y con la Semana Dominicana para la realización de esta y cualquier otra actividad que durante el marco de la semana consideren que nosotros, desde nuestra perspectiva, podamos colaborar. A Roberto Herrera, que ya somos cómplices también, como mencionó esta mañana, en la realización de lo que es la Semana Dominicana. Frank Gutiérrez, que justamente nos conocimos el año pasado en la celebración de la Semana Dominicana en los Estados Unidos y a partir de ahí pudimos estrechar lazos de colaboración y esta es una de las actividades que estaremos realizando durante este año y esperamos otras más en un futuro. Nos gustaría darles la bienvenida a nuestros panelistas, Felipe Amador, Rodolfo Vela, Diego Torres y Andrés es luletil, es luletil. <laughs> es un poco difícil. Uh, we would like to welcome our panelists for today's event. Nos sentimos muy honrados de haber aunado esfuerzos con Dominicans on Wall Street y la Semana Dominicana en los Estados Unidos para la celebración de este panel denominado Hacia Adelante, Crecimiento y Oportunidades de los Mercados de Capitales Dominicanos. We are very pleased to collaborate with DAOs and the Dominican Week in the United States to present the panel Moving Forward, Growth and Opportunities in the Dominican Capital Markets. Realmente la palabra de Moving Forward, decir hacia adelante, como que no, es la traducción literaria, pero no quizá la más adecuada. Eh, quisiéramos agradecer también a la Misión Dominicana ante las Naciones Unidas por la complicidad en esta actividad y sobre todo ag agradecerle a Luz porque siempre ha sido una luz en el camino para nosotros poder lograr estos espacios tan hermosos y tan adecuados para la celebración de este tipo de actividades. We would like to recognize the Dominican Mission to the United Nations for the support and collaboration in this event. A special thanks to Luz for being always so helpful. En nombre de GFDD y de su directora ejecutiva, doña Natasha Despotovich, les damos la más cordial bienvenida y esperamos que este panel cumpla con las expectativas de este impresionante auditorio que tenemos esta tarde. On behalf of GFDD and its executive director, Natasha Despotovich, we would like to welcome you and we hope this panel meets the expectations of this impressive auditorium this afternoon. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Buenas noches. Thank you for coming, and welcome to the 21st edition of Semana Dominicana. Uh, we have a great panel tonight that will look at the growth and opportunities in the Dominican capital markets. Uh, my name is Francisco Gutierrez, and I'm the current president of Dominicans on Wall Street, or DALS. Uh, I think Mr. Ridal touched a bit on it, but um, Dominican Week, for those of you that, that, that don't know, it's a, it's a yearly, week-long series of events that bring together leaders to meet in Washington, D.C., New York, with the idea of strengthening the ties between the Dominican Republic and the United States. Uh, for many years, Dallas has had the privilege of working with the Dominican Week Committee in hosting a capital markets panel. Uh, and this year, we're excited to have partnered with GFDD and the DR Mission. And thanks to them, we're actually here tonight at the UN. So we want to thank them for all their support and assistance in uh, co-hosting the event with us. Uh, before we begin, I want to talk briefly about Dallas and about our mission. Uh, Dallas is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization based here in New York. Uh, it was founded in 1997 by Mrs. Josefa Sicard Mirabal. And uh, Josefa mentioned that she was going to be here tonight. No? Um, she's a Dominican lawyer based here in New York, and she formed part of the, the team that worked on the first ADR issuance, stock issuance by a Dominican company here in the United States. And from that grew the idea of starting an organization that started to connect professional Dominicans working here in New York and also with the idea of connecting with our counterparts in the Dominican Republic and making sure that we were assisting them in developing the capital markets there. And I know she's not here, but we want to thank Josefa. She's still active within the organization. So we want to thank her for everything she's done for Dallas and for this event. Um, and I wish, I wish she was here. I know she was honored by Dominican Week a few nights ago, and uh, she's going to be honored in a few weeks by, as a Latina trailblazer. Um, she's a very established lawyer. Um, um, 
mitigation lawyer here in New York, and she'll be recognized for her outstanding career and her work uh, for the community. DAOs has three main missions. The first is to push the personal and professional development of our members. And we do that by having networking activities and hosting events such as this. The second, our second mission is to assist in the development of the capital markets in the Dominican Republic. And this event goes a long ways towards that. We've had a great working relationship with our counterparts in DR, and we hope that continues under AmCham's leadership. Our third mission is to be an active participant in our community here in New York. Uh, DAOs, uh, not only working with other nonprofits, but making sure that we're communicating with students in the, in the, in the, in the area. Uh, DAOs is honored to form part of multiple career days throughout the year. And it's important for us to share not only what we do, uh, but most importantly, to, to, to underscore the importance of education. And in order for them to take advantage of the opportunities in the workplace, and not just in finance, that they need to make their education a priority. Uh, a bit about nonprofits, and Jamil uh, spoke a bit on, on it. Uh, we met the GFDD team at the last Dominican Week event in October, and here we are tonight. So I think it's only important to expose our members or other interested parties in events and ideas from other nonprofits, but it's also important to give you know, the pool of young, educated Dominicans here in New York a voice in everything that's going on, and also assist, as Mr. Vidal touched on, assisting in the development of the capital markets, and that can take various ways. Um, as the new team, the new leadership team at Dallas wants to do more of all those things to continue to meet our missions. And we, so we look forward to your support, whether as a member or just supporting our events. Um, so you know, feel, uh, feel free to ask us any questions after the event or reach, reach out to us uh, via email. Um, so with that, you know, I want to get started. Uh, moving forward, growth and opportunities in Dominican capital markets. If you were with us last October during our, week, during our last Dominican Week panel, we highlighted the work around the mortgage and trust markets. We discussed the, the work that's being done around the legal and market frameworks in order to have a viable mortgage market. And we're already, we're already seeing the benefits of some of that. And Mr. Vidal touched on that it needs to be more, but we're already seeing some of that work as we're hearing of capital being put to use to finance low and middle income housing in the Dominican Republic. This year, we wanted to take a step back. We wanted to sort of get a broader perspective into the markets. We wanted to have La Bolsa, and through that is, has been so helpful in, in, running, in helping run this event because of their help in contacting um, speakers and in, in giving us ideas on, on topics. So we wanted to bring La Bolsa and hear about the, the ongoing evolution of the markets. We wanted to bring an issuer and here not only learn a bit about the company, but learn how they're using the capital markets in the Dominican Republic. We wanted to hear from a, an, a dealer or a puesto de bolsa and learn and get some perspective into some of those opportunities, not only for issuers, but for investors. And we wanted to get and hear an institutional or international perspective and get a sense of how Dominican companies can and are using the markets here in the US but also how investors are viewing the, 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 the capital markets in the Dominican Republic. So with that, I want to th first thank our speakers and go ahead and introduce them. I want to thank them for taking their, their time to come speak with us tonight. Um, we have Felipe Amador from La Bolsa de Valores de la República Dominicana, the local exchange. We have uh, Diego Torres, general manager of BH de Valores. We have Andrés Slulitel, CFO of... Um, Consorcio Energético Punta Cana, Macao. And we have Rodolfo Vela, who is the director uh, for the credit markets for Latin America here at City Global Markets here in New York. Um, so with that, you know, let's get started. You know, we'll go ahead and hear from uh, Felipe Amador first. We're gonna, hold, we're gonna ask that we hold all questions towards the end. And uh, with that, let's, let's, let's get started. Thank you very much. Um. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Felipe Amador. I work in the Dominican Republic Exchange. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Appreciate Dow's invitation, like they do every year, to actually host us here and to talk about the, the capital markets in the Dominican Republic. Um, 
I think, you know, last, last year we talked about uh, the trust law and how that's going to impact the development in the capital markets in the Dominican Republic. Um, but we wanted to take a step back, just like Frank said, and take a look a little bit about what's happening in, in our economy, you know, from a macro perspective. Focus then a little bit more about what's happening in the, in the capital markets there. We just had a big, a big event happening today, and we're going to talk about it. And then, and then what, what, what's next for us? What's next for the capital markets in the Dominican Republic, and what we should be doing and focusing on the next few years in order to have a well-established uh, capital market in the DR? So. So the Dominican Republic in the last in the last few years, you know, has had consistent and stable GDP growth. Um, recently, the real GDP growth was around around four percent for 2012, and is expected to grow 3.5 this year. However, in the first quarter, we kind of have kind of had like a setback in terms of GDP growth expectations, and that kind of like triggered you know how the monetary policy and the fiscal policy in the second quarter. And probably in the, in the second half of the year, we actually interact with the with the participants in the market. But we still expect that the economy is going to have a, a, a nicely growth for this year. In terms of inflation, uh, inflation has been pretty much in the single digit time. Uh, last year was around 4%, so that's a good indication. And within the target of 5.5, as you guys remember, in 2011 or beginning of last year, Central bank decided to actually uh, have an inflation target rate policy, which is great, and and they're setting their policy rate around five percent for this year, plus or minus one percent. During the first four months of the year, given a little bit about the contraction of the economy, probably not still a contraction, but the slow growth that we had in the first quarter, the inflation rate on an annualized basis was around four percent, which is consistent with prior years. So that's good. Uh, so so we have you know, single digit inflation in, in in the economy as well. In terms of the FX, which is a big indicator for economy and also quite related as well with inflation rates uh, from, from, uh, from a correlation perspective, on average it's been around 4% if you take into account or if you exclude what happened to us in 03 or 04. Uh, really the, the, the depreciation rate in, in our economy has been in, in the single digit. And however, the FX market is still very active. It's around you know, 40 billion a year in transaction of FX market in the Dominican Republic. <clears throat> Given the fact of what happened, you know, as, as, and, and we're going to touch upon this a little bit later, later that last year we did a fiscal reform um, as part of the whole package to kind of get, get the economy on track again. Um, having said that, uh, monetary policy right now has been uh, focusing pretty much on easing the economy and trying to get the, the, the economy reactive again for the second quarter and second half of this year. Uh, new instruments and securities have been adopted for the central bank. This is actually very, very great news for us. The central bank is now doing you know, repo, repo facilities and all the stuff for the interbanks, so that's great. Um, last week event, uh, the, bank, the central bank decided to lower the reserve requirements for the uh, if, for the commercial banks, and that's actually going to free up uh, liquidity to the market. And we're already seeing the impact on, on the interest rates coming down in, in the last week or so. And we actually expect that in the next you know, few months, interest rate will still drag a little bit lower um, a, a, as a result of this measure. So everything is tailored from the economy perspective to kind of like you know, get the economy on track, push, uh, get, uh, get the right incentive in place in order to you know, accelerate the, the, the growth and dynamics of our economy. Uh, from a fiscal policy perspective, we, we, you know, we all know we had a, um, an interesting or high fiscal deficit in 2012. Um, in the first quarter of 2013, you know, we, the government outperformed the fiscal deficit target, um, 0 0.1 of the GDP versus 0 0.7. Mm, that that was pretty much done by you know cutting down capital expenditures from the government perspective, um, but it was so hard everything that happened on the fiscal reform side that pretty much the the, the economy stopped, 
And, and now what we're seeing is, I think as of May, the government is going to start all those programs back again in order to actually you know, put dynamics into the market. We also had uh, the new agreement of Pueblo Viejo Mine as a, a, a big development as well. And that is going to result roughly in about 2.2 billion of revenues over the next four years for the economy. In terms of uh, country sovereign risk, um, B1, B plus stable, uh, the spreads on the bonds in the last, on, on the last 12 months have come down around 130 basis points, uh, greater than what's happened with the you know, emerging markets index from, from, uh, from, J from JP Morgan, you know, a result of, uh, of, of indication of lower risk from a country perspective, given all the measures that we take in terms of increasing the revenue, uh, the revenue side uh, from the government perspective with the fiscal reform and also all the initiative trying to uh, reduce the fiscal deficit that we're gonna have in 2013. In terms of uh, the yields of the, go of the global government bonds, you know, the, the government a few weeks ago, uh, well, like a month ago or so, uh, issued uh, the um, a billion dollar, you know, long notes here in the States, US denominated bonds. Um, and it's trading today around 518. Uh, and has come down actually significantly. It, it, it has been a great performance for the bond in the last few weeks as well. The, the government bond, the 10-year global bond to raise a billion, a, a billion dollar notes uh, in the national market was, um, was a great placement for the Dominican Republic and a great testament for the quality of risk of our economy. It was oversubscribed at six times. Uh, attracting a demand from institutional investors and others of approximately 6.3 billion. Uh, it has been the largest single placement with the lowest average yield, around five and uh, eight, seven and a half. And the bond is roughly trained today uh, uh, at, a, at a premium of five and one eight. Now, something you know interesting to actually witness in the last few months in, in, in the capital markets, it's. Um, it's been the auction process that the government has done in the last few months. And as you can see in this chart, it's quite impressive how come the yields you know, in, the, in the 2018, 23, and 28 maturity bonds has actually come down significantly over the last three months, uh, almost 200 basis points in, in the last three months. And that's, that's all great indication uh, for the capital markets in terms of you know, lowering those yields. It's gonna make it really more attractive for companies to actually come to the market and tap the market for debt issuance and all type of products. So we definitely expect you know, this stable macroeconomic environment to actually you know, promote and, and, and develop uh, the new issuance in the next, in the next 18 and 12 months. Talking more about the capital markets in Dominican Republic per se and leaving aside the macro trends, we, we feel very optimistic about them. We have around 20 corporate issuers. Um, we're mostly a fixed income market. Not really. Today we got our first uh, close end fund trading uh, uh, public offering in Dominican Republic. So that's kind of like quasi equity instrument in Dominican Republic, so that's, that's great. And that's all driven by the 189.11 law of the trust security law, which you know, allows this type of vehicles to actually come to market. You know, we'll probably see you know, in the next week or so you know, the development of, of that issuance, which is, which is something completely new to us. Our market in terms of securities around the market, um, we have roughly 560 billion pesos in instruments under custody. In Cebaldon, that's roughly like 14 billions. And I think when we talked last year, the number was around 420 billion. So it is definitely growing pretty fast. Um, and, 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 and the growth that has taken in the economy has been very consistent and very aggressive. We have also the you know, good thing about the retail investors. We have over 18,000 accounts uh, for institutional individuals, investors in Cebaldon. And, 
Last year, we were roughly around 14,000, and the year before that, we were around 8,000. So really, the growth uh, in terms of people awareness, this is a word that, 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 that Massimo was talking about, the awareness of the capital market and the benefits that they can bring to the table you know, to investors in terms of returns uh, and in terms of you know, portfolio diversification has actually been very effective. We have around 12 brokerage, brokerage firms actively operating in, into the market, and we expect you know few of them, few of others joining shortly. We have two investment fund vehicles registered in in the in the in the in the capital markets, and we have one that actually went up uh, as a public offering today. And then we have a, 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 you know also great news this year, where the Treasury Department actually issued a 15 euro. 15-year-long uh, uh, dated uh, maturity bond, which is which is quite impressive, given the fact that less than a decade ago, you know, the, the longest dated you know debt out there was less than a year. Um, you know, it's it's um, you know you know it's we're going to talk a, a little bit more about that was a quick snapshot about about the capital markets, and then if we focus on the demand side. As, 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 as Massimo mentioned, uh, we, we do have tremendous capacity uh, to finance and to put into work into our local markets. The institutional investors, and by, by that I, I want to refer to the pension funds only, uh, you know, taking aside insurance companies, um, they have roughly $5 billion in asset on the management as of you know, a few months ago. And these funds are growing roughly around 30% per year with no redemptions in the next you know, 10 years or so. Today, they represent roughly 9% of the GDP and they're expected to be roughly 30%, you know, 32% of the GDP in the next 15 years. So we do we definitely have institutional investors that are you know, hung, you know, they're, they're, they're hungry for, for new instrument, for a new type of vehicle to actually deploy capital. And, and try to do something, you know, either locally or in, 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 the, in the outside markets. Having said that, today they cannot invest outside the Dominican Republic, but as you, uh, you know, as you probably imagine, in the trajectory of other you know, countries, usually the, the, the pension fund system will allow the, the, the pension fund managers to kind of go abroad with a small percentages and that, and that growing up to 15% or so in the next few years. So we expect that, you know, some opening, you know, hopefully in, 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 in the medium term, but in the meanwhile, locally, we do have a dry power that is quite impressive and that we should be able with this new 189.11 law about um, trust and mortgages to kind of like push for, for those funds to be deployed and, and, and help develop the, uh, the real economy in the Dominican Republic. Also from the retail side perspective and investor perspectives, um, you know, as, as I mentioned, more than 18,000 open accounts in the sector. Um, they have invested more than one and a half billion as of March of, of this year, and they're growing pretty fast. I think you know, one of the key challenges that we have as a market is that we do have to focus on trying to get the awareness, get, get, get out there and, 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 and try to, to um, I would say that, to, you know, I would say something around try, try to communicate to, the, to, to those investors and individuals the benefits of actually having an account in, in the capital market and investing in our, in our, in our market. Um, the exchange is actually working pretty hard, you know, as, as well as some of the participants in the market have had really aggressive uh, 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 advertising campaigns out there. We're, 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 we're all over the, the universities in the Dominican Republic uh, with lectures, with classes, with uh, seminars. We, 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 we brought in you know, foreign issuers to kind of explain to the market the benefits of actually going to the market. So we, we definitely need to get out there and tell the story about, you know, this is a great opportunity today. I think you have all the pieces in line and, and issuers and investors should actually come together to the market. It's a quick snapshot about uh, you know how well you know how diversified we we have our issuers in in the in, in, in the local economy. Definitely, you know, and, and typical from from small economies like ours, the financial sector is a big player in terms of um, in tapping the market. 
Um, we have a pending one from, from Tricom today, uh, and, and we had a, a Bono Taino from IFC last year. It was 390 million pesos. The, just focus, you know, the, uh, with, with, the, um, with, the, with the uses of funds to kind of like promote uh, development in the, in, the, in the real economy in Dominican Republic. That issuance went out in five seconds. So definitely, you know, strong appetite uh, for that type of, of, of instruments, and, and, and we hope to see them uh, in, in a more established program over the next, uh, over the next you know, 12, 18 months. And then we have the first investment, in, investment fund uh, approved in the Dominican Republic. They actually uh, came, you know, came to market today. Um, they, they, they did the announcement last week. Uh, they opened for trading on the primary market today. They have six months to allocate all that capital. Uh, and definitely it's going to be quite interesting to see you know, how that develops. Uh, I think it's, um, um, it's great for the economy that we have these type of vehicles coming to the market and trying to provide diversity and di diversification and the opportunity for retail investors to actually participate with small amount of money into the capital markets. So stay tuned. Uh, in terms of historical you know, volume negotiated in the capital markets, in the DR, in the primary market, um, we have had a roughly uh, 28 issues approved by, by the day to day. Um, didn't have much of growth in terms of issues uh, last year, but we have had roughly like 20% growth over the next five, o o o over the last four years on a KKR perspective. However, this year has started strong with 50% uh, up versus the prior year, same same time frame. The same on, on the secondary market. Uh, volumes came up. Uh, you know, the, the dip in 2012 was given because 2011 was a very unique year uh, uh, for us in the exchange, because uh, around eight, you know Feb or March of last year, uh, the government opened up uh, the limits or, or the caps that they have on the on the pension fund to invest in central bank. Uh, uh, instruments, and given the given the yields on those instruments and the crowding now that we have there, they pretty much maxed out uh, that capacity, and that created a, a significant trading volume in the first quarter of last year that we, we didn't see again. But if you would take that, those out, we will actually see consistent growth year over year. Um, Another great, great news was that uh, pension funds were allowed to invest in the local U.S. denominated uh, bonds. And as you can see, the, right there in 2012, they, they, they were able to tap those instruments right away. And 10% of, of, uh, of the volume negotiated was actually in the U.S. denominated currency. And we also seen how investors are more prone to actually invest along the yield curve, not just in the you know, 30, 90 days, but actually to put money, especially the institutional investors, to actually look for the yield and, and, and the return and invest in more long dated maturity instruments. And you can see that how, you know, the nine or more years of maturity on the bonds represented roughly 16%. And, and we should expect that, that behavior to continue as, as pension funds really are looking for uh, uh, risk adjusted returns, but definitely looking for, for high yields in the market. Um, I think, you know, quickly touching upon. Uh, looking forward, I think um, uh, having the, the, the trust law, the 189.11 in Dominican Republic, has been of great importance for economy. It did provide legal framework for those type of vehicles to actually come to the market and, and have a, a legal jurisdiction and, and protection. We're going to start seeing, and we, we're already seeing it, you know, uh, Pioneer with the first fund, it's a, it's a fixed income fund. But after that, we, you know, we, we definitely see in the pipeline many, many other funds uh, coming in in terms of uh, uh, either you know, real estate project development or housing development, low-income housing development. Um, we should expect to see guarantee funds coming in and help uh, Las Pymes. Uh, definitely a great vehicle like it has happened in El Salvador and Bolivia and other countries where those type of vehicles has, has actually helped. Uh, the payments actually tap the market and get actually funding, you know, to grow. I think um, I, th I think the, the importance of that law was um, last year when we talked about it in October. We kind of like bullish about it. We, we're now seeing it. That it's actually, you know, quite there and, and, and real. 
and, 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 and the market participants are all over the place trying to figure out what would be the best way to maximize those sort of vehicles uh, uh, in, in the Dominican Republic. Um, I would I would think that um, in terms of of uh, all the things that that we're working on in Dominican Republic, um, last year th there was a new regulation out for the capital markets. It's not the law, but it's, it's la el, la regulación del, del mercado, el reglamento, no? Are uh, the rules to the law came out last year to kind of like put into the frame. Um, the, the, the income trust and, and all those vehicles into, into the law. And however, they, they actually also try to incorporate in, in those regulations um, all the type of a structure that should help the capital market develop in a more structurally way and an and, and efficient, hopefully efficient way. We're definitely working today with the superintendency and the SEC in the Dominican Republic. To, to work on the update and modification of the securities market law in, in the Dominican Republic. We think, um, we think there, you know, a lot, a, a lot, even though it's a 10 year old law, a lot has, has changed in, in our markets and definitely we need, um, we need to update that in order to provide a legal framework to all those vehicles and structures that we're planning to, um, to realize in the, in the near future. The, the exchange also has been working internally a lot to kind of like find the best way to promote and, and, to, uh, and to develop uh, a, a more efficient price discovery process in the fixed income market. Um, we feel that that's the main purpose of an exchange is actually to, to provide uh, uh, the mechanisms uh, to provide a, a price discovery process that is efficient, transparent, and equal for all the participants in the market. And we're constantly looking at you know, developing new technologies and, 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 and working on operation efficiencies to make sure that we can actually have that in the near term. Um, we're also, and, and there, there are a couple, couple initiatives um, that we're working on. Uh, we, you know, we, we realize that the primary market in Dominican Republic has not uh, taken off uh, the way it should. And given the fact that the environment today is quite appealing, you know, for companies to go to the market, we don't see them that that often. So the change is working, you know, to develop a, a, a new program called RD Capital. And RD Capital, what 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 it is is it's a, it's, it's it's a program to help potential issuers come to market. We're working with the IFC to, you know, really focus on uh, corporate governance program, uh, and we're working right now to finalize those terms with the IFC that there will be great partners in this type of program that, you know, to provide corporate governance uh, advisory to these companies that actually enter into the program. And we're working with all the partners as well to kind of like to provide value add uh, to potential issuers that sometimes uh, need the guidance in order to tap the market. And I think the whole idea for the exchange is to take a more active role. Uh, in the primary market in, 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 in terms of educating the potential issuers, the CFOs, the, 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 the CEOs of the companies, that there's great benefits in actually having transparency and actually going to the market. Um, also, another, another you know, thing that we're working on today and we're hopefully launching the program in the next few months, you know, we, 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 we realize, you know, back, I think I talked about this last, last October, but we realize that we need, you know, better mark-to-market um, uh, valuation uh, uh, methodologies in the Dominican Republic, and on top of that, that we actually need a unified one. Um, we needed to kind of like assist the regulators in terms of making sure that there was no uh, regulatory arbitrage within the participants, and that they actually having a mark-to-market methodology that is approved and validated by the by the market will actually help foment and increase the liquidity in the market, trying to actually find for that price discovery process that is efficient. So everything is like a, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of like, we're gonna launch in the next few months, hopefully, you know, we partner with PIPCA, which is a, a price provider uh, from Central America, and we're hopefully uh, out in the market in the next few months uh, with, with vectors and yield curve methodologies and, 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 and mark to market methodologies that, that all the participants in the financial sector should be able to use and implement on, on, on their companies and in their portfolios. 
And I think that's going to be a great way for, for the market to actually you know, focus on not where they put that instrument that is a liquid. 98% you know, of the instruments in any market are illiquid. They don't trade on a daily basis. Uh, we're not a section to that. We actually think that 99% were illiquid. Um, having said that, there are ways, there, there are ways for a market to have you know, a mark to market methodology that is better than mark to model or any other type of methodology that is that could create systemic risk in the Dominican Republic. I think um, I think that's it for the half day. I appreciate you, the time. Um, I'm, we're we're going to be around, you know, for questions. So thank you for, for your time. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Frank, Amcham, and um, I mean, all the people that came to hear us. I understand that you are very interested on the Dominican capital markets. And I want to tell you that um, a couple of weeks ago, I was invited to a conference in a place very close to here, in the Union League Club. It is a place full of history. Abraham Lincoln was one of the founders over there. And the topic was about sunshine bonds, the first conference in sunshine bonds. And uh, it was full of people, more than 300 people. And you had lawyers, regulators, investment bankers, advisors, developers, and all kinds of people interested on that topic, sunshine bonds. First, of, first, first conference on sunshine bonds. What I noticed is that they were talking about a common topic and they were trying to create an asset class. And uh, through all this cooperation and all this collaboration, they were creating a, an asset class. And the asset class is going to happen because all the people are working together to, to achieve the goal. Today I'm planning to, <clears throat> to tell you about the asset class Dominican Republic local bonds. Okay, uh, I remember. It's a, well, this is, these are numbers. No, the, the topic is there are three main characteristics of the Dominican market that uh, can help us create the, the asset class. First of all, you find the numbers. Uh, Felipe was really clear on the numbers. I brought some additional numbers that are prepared by Ministerio de Planificación. Although you might find them a little bit different than the ones that Banco Central produces, that's part of the, our reality. Although I want to point out that in five, three years' time, we have a balanced budget and we have a controlled debt. That's the plan, and if you go to the Plan Nacional de Desarrollo, it's public, you'll find that they are working towards achieving the goals that they planned, they stay established over there. So we have, first of all, people working on the macroeconomics very seriously. We have a government that is represented on the, on the Ministerio de Planificación, and we have a Banco Central also working towards the same goals. In addition to that, we have the demographic consideration. More than 50% of the Dominicans in Dominican Republic are between 20 and 40 years old. There's a huge investment of public monies into education. And if you look at any other country in the world that has this type of structure, it's just a, the great place to start planting seeds towards the development of a capital markets. The numbers that Felipe showed, they are not just by luck. They are showing that something is going on. You have the macroeconomics, well set. You have the demographics, it's starting to plug in. And now you also have governments that I found this very neat um, website that takes one of the speeches of any of them, of any of us, and will take the words that were, was more 
used during the speech, during the speech and then they will increase the size. So we have the last three presidents, three different times in history, 2004, 27 Febrero 2004, 27 Febrero 2012, and 27 Febrero 2013. If you can notice, our last uh, 2013 is highly focused, and mainly I was surprised when I found that the focus are numbers, mil, millones, and Republica Dominicana. So if we blend the three main reasons, demographics, macroeconomics, and the vision of the government, we can create an asset class called Dominican Republic. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank to the committee that invited us uh, uh, as a PEM, thinking CEPEM as a success story in the Dominican um, capital market. Um, I will uh, walk you through the, the, an overview of the company, uh, a brief history about it, and then uh, our um, participation in the Dominican capital market and how we uh, took advantage of it. So, CEPEM is a standalone integrated utility uh, that operates in the east part of the, sorry, I will twist a bit so I can, uh, we transmit, we generate, transmit, and distribute electricity within uh, an exclusive concession area located in the east part of the country, actually Bávaro and Punta Cana, as you may know. Uh, we uh, are part of the fastest growing market in, Domin in the Dominican Republic. We have a, a beautiful view and uh, as we all have beautiful beaches there and uh, a whole infrastructure uh, to serve uh, more than 30,000 uh, hotel rooms and more than 15,000 uh, low voltage client, uh, commercial and residential low tension clients. Uh, a brief overview of the company, we are uh, incorporated in 1992 uh, through a vision of Rolando Gonzalez Ponter, who, who is uh, actually the founder, the main shareholder, and also the, the president of the, and chairman of the board. Um, the company, as I mentioned, started uh, operation in 1992, only with two megawatts installed within the fence of our, one of our uh, former clients. Uh, he's still a, client, he is a, still a client, Barceló. And then we uh, start growing together with, with, the, with the concessionary and the growth and the booming in Punta Cana. Uh, since then, we grow on, on an average basis of 35% uh, year over year. Uh, with, a, in, with a total sales so in 2012, roughly uh, 720 gigawatt uh, on 2012. 80% of that of those uh, sales belongs and uh, became from our large customers that you you may see over there. We are very proud of them and we would like them to keep on uh, having that trend. Uh, we may say that we operate the most reliable system in the Dominican Republic and one of the best uh, in the whole. I won't say Latin America, but for sure in the Caribbean. <laughs> and um, we expand our operation. Uh, to uh, the first uh, wind farm in the Dominican Republic that uh, was uh, actually conceived to be erected uh, within the concession area, but for uh, a bunch of reasons, we relocated and finally installed it uh, in the west portion of the Dominican Republic. Uh, our company has been rated uh, by Fitch Rating on the AAA, uh, which is a top-notch uh, uh, rating that a company may achieve and a double A from Feller Rate, which is an associated of uh, S&P, Standard & Poor's. So we were uh, required to get those, those two uh, rating agencies in order to be allowed it to, to get the, 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 the money from the pension funds. Uh, a bit of history, we, as, as I mentioned before, we started with two megawatts in 1992. Uh, going forward in 1995, uh, CEPEM, 
uh, became a partnership with Endesa, so we, we get the, their knowledge, uh, and they also keep uh, a 30% percent percent of, of the equity of the company. Then 1996, uh, we uh, needed to keep on uh, adding additional capacity to serve the, the, the new demand that was uh, happening on, on the concession area. So we get the support from local uh, and institution, um, sorry, commercial bank, Banco Central Hispano. We get uh, a 15 million uh, expanded up to 30 million for the purchase of two uh, additional engines. Then in 1999, the, our company founded CEB, which is a sister company, 100% uh, owned by CEPEM. And we supply energy to the Bashaibe area with the same, uh, with the same uh, framework. We get the concession and we serve, we uh, generate, distribute, and collect um, electricity in the in the concession area. Now, in in 2000, uh, CEPEM uh, start measuring wind all over the country, uh, so as to get uh, information enough information to um, build up uh, a wind farm. Uh, so and again, we we get supported from from Danida. Together with uh, with the IFC and uh, ABN Amro now is uh, I think it's uh, Royal Bank of Scotland. It was absorbed. Uh, as I mentioned before, the wind farm has been conceived originally to be erected within the concession area, but then we uh, relocated in the west part of the country. Now this uh, wind farm has been placed together with Ejehaina, which is a sister company, and we are together um, dispatching with uh, wind energy with no uh, cost and, and fuel uh, associated with it. Now, uh, between 2006 and 2005, uh, CEPEM uh, saw uh, a boosting, increasing in demand from the um, hotels, and we decided to go uh, not keep on adding more um, engines, but rather um, building up a, a transmission line that connects to La Sultana del Este, which is a, a, a generating barge uh, that belongs to Ejejaina. And from there, we add 100 megawatt of, of additional capacity. So nowadays, we have those 100 uh, megawatts from Sultana, plus 130 megawatts installed with, uh, in our um, plant. So we are able to serve that the, the increase in demand that has been taking place. Well, as you may see, uh, our growth uh, is uh, tight and bonded to the Punta Cana arrivals, uh, and we are ultimately a function of uh, of the wealth of, of Punta Cana. So we we are really focused and would like them to keep on growing. So because if they grow, we grow. <laughs> One more. That is the concession area. As you may see, it seems to be uh, small when compared to, to the rest of the country, but um, half of the tourism arrival uh, happens in that uh, tiny uh, area. Next one. Where, as you may see, we have the transmission line that I have just mentioned that connects uh, Sepen with the Sultana. Uh, on the west part, you see Kilvio Cabrera Wind Farm, uh, which is... Uh, in the same place with Los Cocos, that belongs to Ejejaina. And we have a, a isolated um, engines because we serve some of our clients that, that relies on us to operate those, uh, those um, engines and plants. The, the, the Rio, La Cadena Rio uh, asked for us to, to operate the, 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 the engines that they have in Puerto Plata and Samana. Next one. So as you may see, I, I don't want to talk too much about the electricity sector as a whole, but as, as you may see, the, 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 the disco, the distribution company, had the, the losses of 35%, and the SIDI and SIFI, which are uh, measures of reliability and quality of service, are uh, really um, well, are not that good. They're not complained. And as, as you may see, we uh, have losses of 50%. 5.2% uh, and the SIDI and SIFI, which is uh, how many interruptions or blackouts do you have uh, within one year and how many, uh, how much time do you take uh, to put uh, the service in place. 
So we have a, a world class uh, um, numbers. Well, now jumping into the capital markets. Um, next one, please. Well, this is, this is once again our financial performance. These are big pictures, but as you may see, our sales are, uh, keep on growing year over year. Uh, once again, we are a function of the, of the, of the Bavaro Punta Cana area. So we have an EBITDA stabilized on $35 million a year. And then, uh, next one, please. Well, th this is how we, how we looked like before uh, tapping the market. Uh, as, as you see uh, in, in the former uh, slides, we were uh, taking loans um, that were not uh, tied together. So we, we ended up consisting in, 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 a, in a bunch of uh, loan agreements with local and international and commercial banks, all of them uh, with different covenant security packages re and restrictions that prevented CEPEN, CAPEX plans, and dividend distribution. Uh, CEPEN was looking like a, um, like a project company, but we were uh, a mature company that needs to have a, uh, an overhaul on, on, on its debt uh, um, framework. So that was our, our, those compromise and the cash in hand that, they ha that the company used to have at, at that time. So the next one, please. And then uh, after tapping the market, that was the, 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 the debt profile that the company uh, achieved. As you may see, we have a strong cash position and um, our debt service are uh, 40, for, 40 years uh, in, in average. Uh, the debt to EBITDA stabilized on, in three times. So uh, what, what we gain with, with, uh, with uh, issuing the bonds, we gain flexibility, we get uh, flexibility in our decision uh, making process. We are a capital-wise oriented company. We are always trying to develop new uh, technologies and trying to uh, make our clients more efficient in order for them to keep on growing. And we, we are able to dispose with, with our cash flow with uh, freely, uh, freely. So th this is just a, a, a snapshot on, on what we did. Uh, we placed a uh, hundred million dollars with an average duration of six years. The annual interest rate on average was uh, uh, within 6.5 to 7 percent. We pay monthly interest, and that is something uh, has to be with the, with the, the specification of the Dominican capital markets because uh, individuals saw this kind of investment uh, compared to buying an apartment and rent it. So, uh, as an advice from our book runner, uh, de Valeres, with, it is a coincidence, but Diego is over there. Uh, he told us, okay, guys, uh, I would like you to, to, to pay a uh, monthly basis interest so as to be uh, elected against uh, buying an apartment. So, say, that, that is, you know, more uh, administrative uh, work, but okay, let's do it. Uh, the applicable law is, is a Dominican. Republic law, they are uh, unsecured notes, senior unsecured notes, um, back up with the, the strong balance sheet of, of the company, and the uses of fund has been working capital, uh, debt repayment, and capex. So as you may see, we are uh, really happy to be uh, issuers and part of the Dominican Republic uh, market, and I urge you and any other issues that go to the market and, and, and take advantage of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I've noticed that in every every time that I go to the Dominican Republic or there is a presentation of the DR, people tend to start with a phrase uh, saying, como dominicano or as a Dominican. And I don't have the fortune to be Dominican. I'm from Mexico. But, you know, there may be a possibility I may have to turn Dominican because I've been working on my naturalization form to become a U.S. citizen. And for those of you that have gone through that process, you have to fill out a form where you have to indicate how many days you spent outside of, of the United States during the previous five years. So I, I just finished that this morning, and in the last five years, I spent 200 days in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, so Maximo, you're going to have to host me at some point if the U.S. You know, Department of uh, Homeland Security believes that I should be Dominican as opposed to American. But, uh, but always a pleasure going to the Dominican Republic and, and become acquainted with the country and, and with issuers and, and, and members of society there. Um, we've been very active, uh, fortunately, in the Dominican Republic uh, in, in um, providing advice relating to international capital markets and taking issuers to the markets. Uh, I wanted to go be very brief uh, because I know that there are a lot of questions in the audience, particularly with such good presenters and such good materials. So I'll try to be brief and to the point as to the items that may be of interest to you uh, relating to international capital markets. Um, I'm sure some of you that are issuers or others, advisors, have heard from all sorts of investment bankers that the market is on fire and that the opportunities to issue at the moment are uh, basically have never been out there before and people should take advantage of this time. It so happens there is a, a combination of different factors that is causing all of us to go and tell you that this is a great time for issuers, particularly for emerging markets. The first item, I think it is, has to do with the fact that interest rates, as you know, are at, at a historic low levels. And for better or for worse, I think there happens to be some consensus building up relating to the possibility that interest rates in the United States may actually rise in the not so distant future. Some people may believe that that's not going to be the case. Those of us that live here and they realize the economy is still kind of stagnant may have the view that the, the rates may not go up as quickly as expected. But there is certainly some market makers and market experts that believe that the rates may go up. If that is the case, then uh, definitely our suggestion has been and will continue to be for all issuers, try to take advantage of the time now as opposed to trying to go to market when ratings are expected to come, go up and, and the market expectation is that the value of the bonds you would purchase would obviously become lower. So item number one. Item number two. I think the European crisis uh, had a very interesting effect in making people with a lot of cash, uh, forcing them to review and reanalyze other areas or pockets of investments that they could go to. And as you can see in this in the slide on the right side, you'll see a differential. I, I decided to bring just Mexico and Brazil as the anchor uh, countries in Latin America that people tend to follow the most. And you'll see how uh, at the end of the day, uh, when you look at the risk of the European countries versus these two anchor countries in Latin America, clearly they've offered a lower risk for investors and therefore has caused people to come to the region and look more delicately at what is at stake and what, is, what opportunities are, there are in Latin America. In the last two to three years, um, uh, what we've observed is, 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 a, is a more dedicated um, group of investors into the region. Somebody mentioned earlier today an asset class being formed, and I'm not surprised that's the case. As when we visit investors in roadshows, uh, definitely uh, we rarely go into making presentations about the development of the country or, or statistics about the Dominican Republic. We go straight to Q&A, and we go straight to very complex Q&A uh, because people are informed and they know about the DR and they're wanting to know more about the Dominican Republic. Another interesting item is uh, the emerging market fund flows. Uh, a lot of, I've heard people uh, raise concerns about the competition that may arise from the um, ever more wonderful you know, equity capital markets in, in North America. Uh, that's a fair concern in some instances. I believe that you know, people, particularly the retail buyers of securities may decide to abandon fixed income assets and go into equities. But the reality of things is that when we talk about 144 reg S transactions for uh, issuers in emerging markets, we target buyers that happen to be institutional buyers of fixed income products. So at the end of the day, even though there might be some sort of retail drive towards equities, uh, we don't expect, frankly, a, a severe or, or material change in demand uh, into emerging markets, fixed income um, assets. Um, last, last but not least, I just wanted to show you, um, I guess I should do this because it's easier. Um, at the bottom, of, on the right side, uh, when we look at the regional bond activity, I, I, I want to mention specifically, when you look at 2013, we're actually referring to year to date. And basically, we're in May. Uh, the pipeline is quite robust, mu much more than last year. And the amount of securities being sold in terms of volume is already at half of what we did last year. And you know, so definitely we should be expecting, you know, you know knock on wood, uh, definitely if market conditions prevail the way they are today, 
uh, we should be seeing a, a record year for, for the region. Why don't we go to the next page? Another, another piece of information you would like to see, is, I thought would be interesting for you as well, has to do with Central America and the Caribbean in particular. The historical sovereign issuance, you will see that year to date we have had five issuances that reach almost $4 billion, already exceeding what we did in 2012. A part of a billion out of those almost $4 billion comes from the transaction that the Dominican Republic launched quite recently. And then on the right side, we talk about corporates. Uh, again, we're halfway, you know, not even halfway through the year, and with a more robust pipeline, and we're already at seven issuances, half of the volume of both trades as well as amounts of securities issued at that time. Why don't we go next? Now, I decided to bring this slide to talk a little bit about the, you know, because everybody talks about the markets and everybody talks about how wonderful they are and what a great alternative they are for financing. But I wanted to go very quickly, uh, give an overview as to what is, a, what is a market for an issuer, either for a country or for a sovereign, for a sovereign or for a corporate, and wanted to give a quick highlights of, of, those, of those items. Uh, first of all, when we talk about the market in the international space, we are referring to one free freight regis transactions. These are transactions that are sold to qualified institutional buyers in the United States or people outside the United States under Regulation S. Uh, there is no participation or intervention of U.S. authorities into this. I'm sure many of you have heard about Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, about the Securities and Exchange Commission, and about the expense of maintaining a registration in the United States. That is not the case for one free for regular deals. They are basically, um, if, if you've ever seen them, they're huge, you know, sometimes very large, fairly large offering memorandum, which is, you know, resembles a standard prospectus. And then the company, of course, over time provides information to maintain investors updated as to its developments, et cetera. But there's no per se U.S. authority intervention in these in this kind of offerings. Um, typically, it takes about eight weeks for an issuer to come to market. I mean, it is a very particular time because everybody has to, you know, CFOs, treasurers, members of the legal department, etc. They really have to drop whatever they're doing and dedicate themselves to a bond deal. We normally like to push our clients as hard as, as possible so that they are able to take advantage of windows of opportunity. So it takes about eight weeks approximately for someone to get ready to come to market. On the pros and cons that I wanted to mention, you know, largest pocket of liquidity. A lot of people sometimes think that, you know, well, you know, I have, I, have, I have an interesting cash position and I have a great relationship with my banks locally. That's great, yeah? Except that the moment the banks decide not to lend you anymore for whatever reason, uh, you will not have a way to finance yourself. Or you may, but the cost of financing yourself will be, you know, exceedingly expensive. So in moments like this, particularly when rates are low, when there's demand for paper, and you know people are seeking yield, it is it is exactly the right time to develop that opportunity to create a new venue, a new avenue for for purposes of financing oneself. And I feel like you know one free for regular transactions you will see when we talk about the DR itself generally generates you know or, or, or provides a huge access to what the largest pocket of liquidity basically for purposes of, of funding. Um, likewise, uh, bonds, depending on the business, depending on, on the credit and the, on market conditions, can go for quite long periods. Uh, we just did a transaction for uh, El ICE, Instituto Costa Rica de Electricidad, uh, state-owned entity. They came to market with a 30-year piece of paper, first uh, Central American corporate to come to market with that tenor, uh, and did quite well. Uh, they basically were able to get 10 times over subscription. They issued uh, $500 million. They had $5 billion in their books. Uh, high quality orders, all of them. And, uh, and they were able to bring down uh, the, the yield of their bond. Uh, you know, we started with the initial thoughts of 7%. Uh, that helped us build a very big dynamic book with extremely good orders. And we were able to basically close at a yield of 6.5%. Uh, ISE had issued a 10-year piece of paper a couple of years ago for $500 million total, and they, at the time, the yield that they were able to obtain was 6.95%. So things have changed dramatically in the market, lots of liquidity again, lots of interest in, in, in paper, and particularly allowing the company to, an, electric comp an electricity company, no, 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 no less, which obviously has a very particular investment cycle they spend a lot of money in building, and EBITDA doesn't come right away. It takes a long time for projects to get built. They like international bonds, particularly 30 years, because they'll have enough time to build up their EBITDA necessary to be able to, to, to grow. Um, 
some may decide, you know, bonds also have provide you with a, a you know free up cash cash flow. Um, bond loans, uh, you know, it's their nature. They will be amortizers, and that's not the case with bonds. Bonds have a bullet payment. In some instances, some issuers decide to um, get a soft amortizer, that like we call them, and they basically are securities that settle or that exactly that settle mature the three last years of existence of the bond. But that's a bit that's not very usual. But at the end of the day, what I'm trying to make a point here about is that you will not have to amortize the security during its life, but at the very end. Um, last, but I think quite important for a lot of companies is the fact that the securities actually contain provisions or covenants that are incurred based or incurrence based covenants as opposed to maintenance. When you have a loan, you have to send a certificate every quarter explaining you are in compliance with the terms of the, of the loan. When you do a bond deal, that's not the case. As long as you don't take any actions that may actually break the, the, the covenant, then you have it incurred into anything that would cause a potential default. So it is a very benign um, uh, you know, covenant structure uh, that facilitates business and again, free, free sub cash flow in, in the sense that there is no amortization per se. Some people like to look into the negatives. I, I brought them so that it's a, it's, a more, it's a fair analysis, I think. And needless to say, there is a lot of work to be done, disclosure has to be prepared, and people have to obtain ratings from at least two, two rating agencies. That takes work uh, at the outset because you have to, number one, pay the fee for the rating agency, which goes to anywhere between four and five basis points of an offering. Uh, but on top of that, you need to maintain that rating over time, and it is a, it is a cost. Um, again, there's only one drawdown. There's no such thing as having a period during which you won't draw the entire amount. You get the cash right away. So if you don't need the money right that second, uh, you may have an issue with negative carry. So it's something you need to be very careful as to how exactly or how much you need to be able to size your bond properly. Um, limited pay prepayment flexibility. Bondholders like to have uh, you know, duration. That's why they're in the market. And they, you know, 10-year bonds typically are not callable for, for five years. If you issue a seven year, it's not callable for four. So there is, there is a bit of a, 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 not a problem, but something to take into consideration. This is different from a loan where you may be able to prepay sometimes without penalty. Uh, and, and they are, you know, they tend to be slightly more expensive than bank financing. Got to remember that bank financing, particularly in, in the countries where we work, tend to be relationship-based, and, uh, and there's a lot of cross-sell. So Bank X may be able to lend you $100 million, but, and they charge you less for that loan, that the margin is quite attractive. But then again, Bank X, ourselves included, Citigroup, we would have other sources of business that will come with that loan, and therefore that kind of puts everything in a level. In the context of a bond deal, that's not the case. Investors simply, there's no cross-sell. They just simply need to be paid back for their investment. Um, in a traditional cap, let me just see one thing, I, I don't know if you jumped. Oh, just if you can go back for two seconds. Uh, and uh, again, you know, the, the most common pro use of proceeds, refinance debt, reprofile debt, and general corporate purposes. We see dividend deals as well. It is not unusual for companies that are very well off and with great credit metrics to actually go, go ahead and do a bond for a, with the purposes of distributing a dividend to shareholders. Investors know about this, and they typically ask for a premium. But generally speaking, uh, people rather use a bond transaction for, you know, particularly for capex or to increase liquidity positions. The next page, I just wanted to go very quickly over the, you know, most of our issuers. If you can go to the next page, please. Uh, our corporates and financials. Um, this is the this is the one that I don't like, but I wanted to show it to you all the way to the to the left. You see, by country, Brazil and Mexico, uh, we, I guess, figure in other. So that's 7%. And there's, there's a lot of work to be performed uh, in the region and enticing people to come to market because definitely um, I cannot tell you how many times we come out of investor meetings and people tell me I'm not doing my job because I'm not convincing enough people to come to market. Because uh, people really like, you know, the Dominican Republic and, and the Caribbean region, and they really expect to see more assets com coming from from the region. Um, w before I go to case studies, I wanted to raise awareness of, of a very important um, thing that your the government uh, put, was able to put together in partnership with Citigroup, and that is a GDM program, um, Global Depository Notes. Um, 
you know, investors, in, in international investors, like I said, I mean, and I, and I can't say it enough, uh, like the Dominican Republic very much and have ha found that they would be happy to be exposed to Dominican, ri Dominican uh, risk, whether it is in U.S. dollars with securities governed by U.S. law, New York law, or by securities issued in Dominican peso. The securities issued in Dominican peso are basically sold off in auctions in, in country. A lot of investors do not have access to come to country and they find it impractical to open up an account locally and some of them actually, even if they have an account locally, may have concerns about the depth of the market and would prefer to own a security which mirrors the actual security, local security itself, but that is tradable in Euroclear so that in the event that they want to dispose of that security, they can sell it to other international investors which have no restrictions to purchase GDNs. In that context, just by the country coming to market by itself, uh, you can see that the amount at outstanding at this moment in GDN format is $450 million. So we think a huge success. If I'm not mistaken, the market is dynamic and may have shifted, but I believe that the 15-year uh, point in the curve for the DR has compressed anywhere between three to 400 basis points. And we think it is a direct result of exactly having additional demand in the market, which therefore removes you know, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the removes the, the cap, put it that way, on the demand for local, local paper. Let me go for another, the next page. I think, I think Felipe touched upon the, the transaction uh, of the Dominican Republic that we, we were very proud to be joint book runners of uh, quite recently. Um, I, I, you know the numbers, you know where, you know where, what we came out at, um, at the time, the five and seven eight uh, yield was exactly, uh, basically, the, the Dominican Republic paid zero new issue concession. For those of you who have not heard this term before, I'll be happy to explain. Normally, when you have an issuer like the Dominican Republic, which has bonds that are quite liquid in the market, our syndicate desk, what they do is they look at that at the secondary levels, and then they extend yield to adjust for the duration of the new bond. And then on top of that, investors require something that we call a new issue concession. Typically, that new issue concession may be anywhere around 15 to 25 basis points, depending on the market. In the context of Dominican Republic, the day, that particular day, there was no payment of new issue concession. And I think I, I really want to congratulate the government uh, who were absolutely rock stars in going to every single investor that we told them to go to. It was probably one of the longest roadshows I've ever been to, and one in which we had meetings, eight to nine meetings a day, in which the government dedicated a very whole team that was very well prepared to answer all questions very precisely. For the audience to know about those questions, the investors were concerned about a few things. One, it was any issues relating to Barrick. They were concerned about the electric system, and they were concerned about the, I the status of the IMF agreement. And they were also con concerned, although yet very appreciative of the tax measures that were taken, but those items relating to the fiscal deficit. Um, it is no coincidence that the bonds are now trading at 5 and 1 eighth because they've had a serious appreciation. When we priced this transaction, those bonds were at $100. They were sold at par. They remained, they probably went up $1 the day after because there was a lot of unsatisfied demand, but then they fell down to, to stay at par for a fair number of weeks, basically since issuance. I remember coming to the office one day and being very scared when I saw those bonds going up to $104 and $105, pushing the yields down to 5 and one eighth. And I didn't understand why that had happened, but there was a big ad that was sent around in the, in the literally it said, Problemas con la barric resueltos. That was the, what our traders had sent around. So that created that appreciation of the bonds and basically all of the other, all, basically every single asset class of the government out there. And you know, fortunately, um, I think the market got the message that the Dominican Republic is serious about its relationships with international investors and, uh, and that there's no intent whatsoever to change uh, you know, materially or in an antagonistic fashion any terms that had been agreed to with, with Barrick. Um, there's another transaction that we did. Why don't we just go back, go, go one. You can keep going. No, I'm sorry, not back, but forward. Okay. I, I mean, you know, again, this is, this is a picture of just the demand we had, but let's keep going forward. Another, another transaction we, we worked on at the, at the beginning of the year was Banco de Reservas. 
uh, they, they came to market with a smaller transaction. It, it didn't reach benchmark size. They wanted to do something a bit smaller. Uh, they came to with $300 million, and we basically priced the transaction at 7%. The interesting thing about this trade is that, and I think sometimes it goes quite unappreciated, you know, for anybody sitting in the Dominican Republic and actually in the United States, when we think about DR, we're getting a little bit chiflados and spoiled. And we, we think 5% is like our number. And I agree, 5% is our number now. Except that when we talk about uh, bank debt, when we look at senior debt in anywhere in Central America, for many financial institution, that tends to trade at around 100 basis points over the sovereign. When you go to subordinated debt, which is quasi-equity, then you go to a differential of around 200 basis points. I remember perfectly the, the moment when we decided to launch this transaction and price it, that uh, we were looking at uh, Banco Estado and Banco do Brasil. And Banco Estado and Banco do Brasil at that time, uh, on a G-spread basis, were exactly at 200 basis points over their sovereign. And I remember if you go one page forward, uh, Banco de Reservas basically priced at 193 basis points over sovereign, which I think for us was a huge success and we completely congratulated the bank for their efforts in the roadshow, but it was definitely a deal that came within, you know, standard valuation for what would be, what would be uh, a subordinated transaction. Um, that's what I brought and more than happy to answer any questions when they ask us to sit over here. Just, uh, if, if I don't make it to the U.S. natural decision process, somebody m must invite me to the R because I'll be more than happy to move there. Thank you.